Um, today we want to talk about estate planning after the um, uh, American Taxpayer Relief Act of 2012 and how we think it's going to change planning for the future. Um, for uh, We have some new people here, so let me just introduce myself. I'm Lauren Detzel, and uh, this is Brian Malik and Matt Ahern and David Akins, and we're all going to be talking today, and hopefully there will be a little bit of time afterwards uh, for you all to ask questions. As has the case with most of our programs, we have a lot of material, um, and you will see that we've put together a rather extensive outline. We will cover uh, it quickly, go through it quickly. I'm sorry we won't get to go over everything. Uh, we try and get you in and out with lunch uh, so that you're not spending too much of your day here with us uh, but if you have questions please come up and ask us afterwards so let me go ahead and get right into it and start with uh, what uh, happened uh, at the end of last year at the beginning of this year let's start if we can with what was the law prior to the 2012 tax act and just very quickly, we all know that it provided for a 35% top rate for a uh, state gift generation skipping tax. This is the law as it was last year before the change in the law. We had a $5.12 million gift generation and state tax exemption. We had portability of a state and gift tax exemption between spouses. We had a 35% top income tax rate, and we had a 15% top rate on long-term capital gains and qualified dividends. But that wasn't really the story. The story was, what was it going to be come January 2013 unless Congress acted? And we've all heard that. We heard it all last year, that what the law was going to be this year, but for the passage of the new act, was we were going to have a 55% top rate for a state gift and generation skipping tax with even an additional 5% surtax. Uh, we had a million dollar estate gift tax exemptions. The generation skipping exemption was going to be a little more, uh, uh, about 1.4 million, because it was cost of living adjusted, no portability. We would have had a 39.6 top income tax rate, a 20% top rate on long term capital gains, and uh, dividends would be taxed at ordinary rates, and a 3.8% surtax on net investment income. So, that's not what we got. What did we get? Okay. So let's look at what we ended up with uh, with the Tax Reform Act of 2012. Uh, we got, uh, first of all, the first permanent estate gift and generation skipping tax rules that we've had in 12 years. Now, this is as permanent as it gets in Washington. Uh, Congress can always change it and has frequently, but at least it's not subject to a sunset or a provision that says this is no longer going to apply unless something else happens. So as I said, this is about as permanent as it gets. That doesn't mean this is the way it's always going to be. <laughs> We've seen rates go up, come down, go up, come down. However, we've never seen exemptions go up and come down. We've only seen exemptions go up. So whereas I think it is entirely possible for rates to change in the future, I think it would be a very unusual situation if we saw these exemptions go down. Okay. So what did we end up with? We ended up with a 40% top rate for a state gift and generation skipping tax. We have a $5 million state gift and generation skipping tax exemption that is indexed for inflation after 2011. That's how we got to the $5,120,000 exemption for last year. This year, it's $5,250,000 and will be indexed going forward. Um, this gives us back unity. This, the estate and gift tax exemptions became unified again permanently. Back in 2001, they took them apart and had different amounts. Now they're back together with the same amount. And as usual, lifetime gifts in excess of the uh, annual exclusion will reduce the estate tax exemption available at death. Those rules that we've had are still the same way it's going to be going forward. And in addition, we got portability to be permanent. 
This is going to be the big game changer that we're going to be talking about today and for a long time to come. What do we do now that we have high exemption rates, um, amounts, and permanent portability? Before we talk about portability, let's talk about a few other things that happened last year. And that was the fact that the way that they did the Tax Act uh, allowed for some of the really good provisions that we got in the Bush tax bill back in 2001 to stay in effect. They were going to sunset out, but basically they got rid of the sunset, which allowed those good provisions uh, to be made permanent. Just a couple of them, uh, the automatic allocation of generation skipping exemption to lifetime transfers. This is really important. Before 2001, when uh, a, a good example is people would create life insurance trusts and make gifts that were under the annual gift tax exclusion, didn't file any gift tax returns, uh, and therefore didn't allocate any generation skipping exemption. And before 2001, that was a very bad thing if that trust was a generation skipping trust. After 2001, unless you opted out of the automatic rules and you failed to make that generation skipping exemption allocation on a return or you didn't file a return, then you got an automatic allocation. This was a wonderful provision we were afraid we were going to lose, but now we know it's permanent. Another one is our ability to divide trust between um, uh, exempt and non-exempt portions. So we can take a trust that would otherwise have a mixed inclusion ratio for generation skipping tax purposes, which is bad, and now we can divide it into a trust that's wholly exempt and a trust that's wholly non-exempt, which makes it much easier for all the accountants and administrators in the room to manage those trusts. Um, and then there were some income tax provisions, of course, uh, that really kind of dwarfed the estate tax provisions. And Brian is going to talk about those in a few minutes. But basically, we know that we got a 39.6% top rate uh, for uh, ordinary income uh, individuals of $400,000 or 450 filing joint a top rate of 20% for long-term capital gains and qualified dividends. The 3.8% surtax is here to stay, people, and it is going to be something that we're going to have to deal with and uh, really analyze with respect to all the trust that we have out there uh, and uh, plan around that. Uh, and in addition, for 2013, they also gave us that special provision for uh, individuals who ha are 70 and a half and want to make a contribution directly from their individual retirement plans to charities. They are able to do that. You remember we had that provision from 2006 to 2011. We didn't have it in 2012. They've brought it back for 2013 only with a carry makeup rule for 2012 that if you didn't already do it, it's over. Um, uh, and so we may want to take advantage of that for this year. Who knows whether it'll get extended in, uh, to next year or not. Some other things that were kind of important that were not in the bill. Okay? Uh, and these are things that are still on the president's wish list. They're in what's called the Green Book. And in fact, we're expecting to see a new Green Book out any day now with what the current wish list is for the administration. But there are some things that have been on that wish list for a while that bother us greatly. I just came back from the ACTEC annual meeting in uh, Hawaii and was on a panel with a very close friend of mine who forecasts, he's from Washington, he usually knows exactly what's happening. I have to say he did get the Romney thing wrong. But other than that, he's really pretty good at forecasting what is happening in Congress. And so his take on some of these, I'm going to tell you. Um, the really important ones that we've been hearing about for a while are basis consistency for income and transfer tax purposes. He says that's an absolute positive going to pass. Not sure if it's going to pass this year, but it will pass. Uh, the valuation discount changes, right? These have been in various different formats uh, over the last few years, 
As we know, Congress, uh, really Treasury, hates the whole discounting thing, and so they've been trying, since they haven't been terribly successful in court battles, they are working legislatively to change the valuation discounting rules, and he believes that's going to pass, but probably not this year. Um, limitations on grats. Again, anything that was really a good thing, uh, Congress has wanted, Treasury has wanted to try and uh, uh, scale back our ability to use it. GRATs are one of those. Uh, they, instead of allowing us to do those zero out um, uh, low years, two or three or four year GRATs, they want to see a 10 year uh, minimum term for GRATs and a remainder interest that must be greater than zero. Uh, that's going to pass. Again, just not sure if it's going to pass this year. A new one, one that came in just a couple of years ago but has really picked up a lot of momentum, is the 90-year limitation on the generation skipping exemption. I hate this one. This is one that I think is really uh, not a good thing, but it has a high likelihood of passing. And that is that your allocation of generation skipping exemption will essentially um, go away after 90 years. So once a trust has been around for 90 years, then the zero inclusion ratio is going to go to a one inclusion ratio, which means it will all be subject to generation skipping tax after that. So stay tuned to see if that passes, how it ta passes, and, and, and what we would want to do. By the way, that's one of the reasons why we tried to maximize gifts last year uh, into generation skipping trusts because anything that has been done before this passes will be grandfathered in. Um, and then the one that gives us all the really biggest uh, pause for concern is their uh, attack on grantor trusts. Uh, Treasury really does not like the grantor trust uh, area at all and they have proposed that any grantor trust will be included in the estate for estate tax purposes. This includes life insurance trusts. Okay. This is not a good thing. And we had a meeting, several uh, members from my group had a meeting with uh, representatives of Treasury last week and um, uh, went over all of the technical problems that we felt that this caused. And let's just say they were not terribly responsive. Um, so we feel that this is something that they are going to push heavily uh, and we are going to be fighting it heavily. Uh, so stay tuned to see what happens with that. It is a, uh, would make a lot of difference in a lot of our existing trusts if it did in fact pass. Now let's turn and look at portability. This is the really big change for 2013 going forward. For the last two years, we've had portability, but because it was slated to sunset at the end of 2012, we didn't really do any planning with it, because how do you plan for something that's only going to be around for two years? Now that it's permanent, it's going to make a big difference in what we do. So let's just have a little refresher on what is portability and how does it work, and then we're going to start talking about how are we going to plan with it. Portability is that concept that allows the second spouse to die to use the unused estate tax exemption of the first spouse to die. Okay. So previously, in order to use the exemption amounts for both spouses, each spouse had to have assets in their own name. They had to create a bypass trust for the surviving spouse that would not be included in the surviving spouse's estate when they died. That was the way to take advantage of both spouses' exemptions because it was a use it or lose it kind of thing. If you didn't actually use it when the first spouse died, then you lost it. And now with portability, it is possible uh, if you so elect, for any unused exemption amount from the first spouse to be ported over to the second spouse. So if we have a situation where the wife has absolutely no assets in her name, just as an example, and husband has $10 million of assets in his name, under the old rules, if the spouse had died first, we would have completely lost that spouse's $5 million exemption. And so when the second spouse dies, he would only have his $5 million exemption, and we would have lost $5 million of exemption. Under portability, under that example, now 
the wife's entire $5 million exemption can be used by the second spouse, by the husband. And this is going to, at least initially, we think, make things look a lot simpler. You don't have to create those bypass trusts in order to take advantage of the exemption. You can simply leave everything outright to the surviving spouse, elect portability, and the second spouse gets both exemption amounts. Is it going to be that simple? No, of course not. Um, in fact, it may be that we have to do even more planning because of portability, but let's walk through and see what life under portability is going to look like. By the way, the gift tax exemption is also portable. Okay. So the surviving spouse can use the deceased spouse's unused exemption, which is called the DSU amount, Deceased Spouse Unused Exemption, DSUE, can use this spouse's DSU exemption to make gifts. And in fact, if they have elected portability and the second spouse has a DSU amount from the first spouse and makes a, a gift that would otherwise be subject to tax, they must use the DSU amount first. Okay. So it gets used first. Now, what's interesting is that, again, they didn't want to make anything easy, so they provided that the generation skipping exemption is not portable. So we have estate tax exemption portability, gift tax exemption portability, but not generation skipping tax portability. So if we want to use the generation skipping exemption of both spouses, we're going to have to make sure we take advantage of it when the first spouse dies, or we're going to lose it. And also, the DSU amount is not indexed for inflation. We've talked about the exemption amount is indexed for inflation, but when the first spouse dies, whatever the exemption amount is that is left over is frozen and doesn't go up. Okay? That will be important in a moment. And lastly, in what was a technical correction, the only real other provision that they put in ATRA, was something, if you all looked at it, you might have looked and said, why did they do that? I don't understand what that change in that definition was. Well, what it was, was to provide for portability of a deceased spouse's to sue amount to a new spouse. Okay, so follow me here. Husband one dies, has $2 million of to sue amount. That's excess exemption. All right, elects portability, so now the surviving spouse has her five and her husband's two for a total of $7 million, okay, exemption. Now the spouse remarries, and she dies before husband two dies, and portability is elected. How much does husband get? Does he get just his wife's five million, or does he get that two million that she got from her first husband? Well, they determined that it's going to be the latter, that the second husband is going to get to use the DSU amount from the first husband. Okay? Now, if you don't think that's generated a lot of jokes about trolling nursing homes and, <laughs> and okay, well, what's your DSU amount? Oh, no, no. This, why, this woman over here has got a DSU amount of $8 million. Yours is only six. Okay. Uh, a lot of jokes. But yes, there's no longer any privity required, which was what we thought was going to be the case. Uh, so this is a, a good thing. So now let's look at what are we going to do with portability. Remember we said that portability is the ability to give everything outright to the surviving spouse and take advantage of the first spouse's exemption that you don't have to have a bypass trust anymore in order to take advantage of the estate tax exemption of the first spouse to die. But maybe we like a bypass trust for other reasons. So let's look at that. In the past, because the transfer tax, the estate tax stuff, was so important, it really drove the bus. We didn't really have to focus on all of the other great reasons why we liked bypass trusts. Now we do. Now we have to really look at what are we giving up if we <coughs> provide for the simple approach of leaving everything outright to the surviving spouse and not having a bypass trust. Well, we're giving up, first of all, asset protection. If assets are in a bypass trust, we know, particularly in Florida, that they are very, very protected against creditors of the surviving spouse and other beneficiaries of that trust. If it's outright to the surviving spouse, not protected. 
We also know that if assets are in a bypass trust, they are very protected against a divorce settlement of the surviving spouse or other beneficiaries. If outright to the surviving spouse, not so necessarily. Uh, um, and then there's management protection. Many people like to have leave assets in trust because they're concerned that their spouse may not be able to manage those assets well, particularly as they age, right? You give it outright to a surviving spouse, you don't get that management protection. And probably the most important thing, and certainly in a number of families, is that if you give the assets outright to the surviving spouse, then the surviving spouse can do anything they want to with those assets when they die which may not be giving them back to the children of husband, deceased husband's first wife. Okay? So the children from a prior marriage may end up not getting anything or not getting what the, the, the deceased husband thought they were going to get uh, when the spouse later dies. So in blended families, it may be the single most important factor is to make sure that you can control the ultimate disposition of the assets, which you can do, obviously, if you have a trust. If you leave it in trust, when the second spouse dies, the assets go however the first spouse says they're going to go in under the terms of the trust. Outright, there's no control over that. So being able to control the ultimate disposition is, is, could easily be, in many cases, the only thing that anybody is really looking at. Okay. Um, and then there's another um, uh, little bit of, uh, uh, that, that can be very important, particularly in circumstances where we have a taxable estate, and that is, remember I said the DSU amount is frozen, okay? It doesn't increase. But if you put assets in a bypass trust, okay, using the exemption amount, then whatever those assets are worth later on when the second spouse dies are out of the estate. So if they've doubled or tripled, all of those assets are out of the estate. So the appreciation from the death of the first spouse to the second spouse escapes estate tax, which does not happen if you use portability because the DSU amount, again, is frozen and doesn't go up. And a good example of how that can be important is on page seven of our outline. And here is, you see the, the um, uh, juxtaposition of using a credit shelter trust versus using portability. And in our little example, we had assets growing by 6% a year, and um, we had um, 20 years later, the second spouse dies, and the estate had grown, the bypass trust had grown, and if we had used portability, we would have ended up paying an additional tax of $1,226,000 over no tax if we had used the bypass trust. So in a taxable estate, that can be an extremely important um, consideration as well. And so are there any disadvantages? to that using that bypass trust. Why aren't we just saying, well, you know, portability sounds great, but why aren't we always using a bypass trust? Well, that's because there is a disadvantage. One of the, the probably the most important disadvantage, other than just the complexity of doing the trust, is that the assets that are in a bypass trust don't get a step up in basis for income tax purposes when the second spouse dies, and they do if the spouse owns those assets in her name alone. Okay. And so this may be a very important point. Step up in basis may be important, it may not be. If you've got a managed portfolio, you're going to be having gains or losses captured all along, okay? It's not like it's going to be held for 20 years and you're never going to change anything and there's never going to be any gains. So step up in basis may not be all that important or there may be assets that you're not going to sell. Uh, a family business is not going to get sold, so the step up in basis may not be important, but there may be circumstances where the step up in basis is very important. Well, can we have our cake and eat it too? Well, maybe we can, right? And one of those ideas, which David is gonna talk about in, in more detail, uh, as he is about all of these approaches that I'm gonna uh, leave you with in just a moment, is that what if, instead of creating a bypass trust, what if our estate plan says, let's leave everything in what we call a Q-tippable trust? That's a trust that that could qualify for the Q-tip marital deduction. 
meaning that it provides for all income to be distributed to the surviving spouse. Okay. So we have the ability okay, to make a Q-tip election or no Q-tip election or a partial Q-tip election, depending upon what the circumstances are when the second spouse dies. It's in a trust, so we get all those benefits of, of, of the trust protection against creditors, divorce, and, um, and uh, have the ability to control where it goes when the spouse dies. Okay. But what is the income tax consequence of a Q-tip trust if a Q-tip is actually elected? Right. It's that the assets are included in the surviving spouse's estate, but we've gotten portability, so we're not as concerned about that. And what happens when you have a Q-tip election is that the assets are included in the estate and get a step up in basis. Right. So if you leave it to a Q-tippable trust and you actually make the Q-tip election and you make the portability election, then you can get your step up in basis Okay. get your portability, use both exemptions, and get your trust benefit as well. Right. So now what you don't get is the appreciation from the first death to the second death outside the estate because it's all included in the second spouse's estate. But so this Q-tippable trust may be something that we're looking at. Uh, David's going to discuss it and some options with it and some possible concerns about it. There's a rev proc out there that gives us a little bit of, of concern, but we think maybe not too much. And so it really comes down to three approaches that, that the panel is going to discuss here. You, the first approach is our traditional approach, is use the bypass trust. Just do what we've been doing. Okay. The second approach is to leave everything outright to the surviving spouse, but at least with that, provide for the spouse to disclaim some portion of it. And if disclaimed, it goes into a bypass trust. So the surviving spouse can make a decision when the first spouse dies about whether they want to have anything go into a bypass trust for all of those reasons we've just discussed, or three, everything into this Q-tippable trust. That's really where we're going to see our planning go in the future, one of these three approaches. And to discuss them more and the circumstances on when you would use them and some nuances, David's going to talk. Okay, thank you, Warren. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to just, <clears throat> before I get into that, I want to talk about a couple of things that are on page nine. You know, we all have a lot of clients who made large taxable, large gifts to use up the exemption that we thought might have been going away last year or even in 2011 for my really uh, paranoid clients who thought Congress might take it away during 2012 before it was set to expire. Um, still probably a good thing to get it out earlier and, and get that much more appreciation out of their estate. Um, so we've, we've got these trusts that were, you know, a lot of month, time and effort and money were put into drafting these trusts that received these large gifts, let's say at the end of 2012. And, you know, thought should be given when someone dies under their will or their trust, do you pay it then into new testamentary trusts that are set up under that document? Or do you, do you want them really, do you want everything to be dovetailed and everything to be distributed in, uh, under the same terms as that trust that was set up last year? And you may want that or you may, you may not want that. You may change your mind about how things, uh, you want things distributed from what you provided in 2012 as far as division among your descendants and the time that they can withdraw the assets or when they receive them outright. Um, you know, you could, a middle ground would be to have, uh, create testamentary trusts at your death that were so similar enough with the trust, the irre irrevocable trusts that were created in 2012 so that you could combine them. Uh, if, if those provisions, you know, that's allowed by state law uh, or could be allowed by the trust, uh, a trust agreement. Um, you, a client may have created a trust last year and made a substantial gift to it. You know, husband and wife may have put transferred as much as $10 million. Those trusts may have or may not have been grantor trusts. If they were grantor trusts, the grantors, the, the individuals, are liable for the income taxes on those trusts going forward as though they still own the assets. Um, you know, that transfer, and, and there may have been pre-existing grantor trusts too. You, you may want to, you know, assess with your clients and their accountants whether the client can still afford to pay the income tax on all of these grantor trusts or whether 
you know, action should be taken to toggle that, toggle that grantor trust status off so that the individual is no longer personally responsible for the income taxes uh, on the trust assets, that the trust pays those. Um, I had several clients who made large <coughs> gifts last year, Outrider and Trust, that were meant to substitute for provisions that they'd made in their will or their revocable trust. And you want to make sure that you go back and review their client's existing documents, take out those, what was in their revocable trust or will, so these, these beneficiaries don't have a windfall. They don't receive twice as much as the client had originally intended. Um, you know, you need to go back and look at formula clauses in wills and trusts. That is, if you have a client who's got, gave away everything last year, they've got an additional 130000 due to indexing, an additional $130,000 basic exclusion amount this year, but they've got to still have a $10 million estate. You know, do you want to put $130,000 into a trust? Um, or even, you know, a more, I guess, technical issue, if you have a, a pecuniary marital and a residuary credit shelter trust and you've got a $10 million estate and the estate goes down by a little over 1%, you've wiped out the residue. You've gotten no benefit from that by the time you fund, uh, fund the trust. Um, you know, I think Lauren covered, there's a little bit of overlap among all of us uh, in, in our presentation. She covered a lot of the reasons. Uh, why people still need to have wills and revocable trusts. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, people were doing wills and, and revocable, wills at least, and, and revocable trusts before there was an estate tax. And there's still valid reasons for doing that. You know, you want to control how your assets are disposed of after your death. You may have a family business. You may want to control how the stock or member interests in that or partnership interest go to some family members who are involved in the business as opposed to those who aren't. Uh, you may want to leave assets in trust to protect from, you know, as Lauren said, you know, creditors, predators, uh, you know, second spouses, uh, you know, any, any, you know, people who would exercise undue influence over your spouse or children. You may have spendthrift children. Uh, you may have children who can't control their desire to spend money, um, uh, you know, whether it's theirs or other people's. You know, a lot of clients want to make uh, significant charitable uh, gifts at death. And so, you know, a lot of these things are going to apply to all clients, but we, in the outline, we sort of broke it down into three groups or three tiers. You have your, your tier one clients, who are those people whose combined gross estates, husband and wife, are less than the uh, basic exclusion amount, $5,250,000. So you're going to focus on those core dispositive provisions, you know, how do they want their assets controlled and disposed of after their death. Um, you know, you're, it's probably going to be in the best interest of the family to make the portability election at the first death for those people. Um, if, if, if for some reason they say, we're not interested, we want, don't want to spend the money to file an estate tax return, even though it's a, a kind of a reduced requirements for an estate tax return if you're just electing portability, you probably want to get a written waiver from the personal representative and the people who are going to be affected by that decision saying that they, you know, consent to that decision. In fact, if you rep represent the, the personal representative, you would want to get a waiver uh, from the beneficiaries on their behalf too, probably. Let's say that one more time because for the, for the planners in the room who might be doing tax returns or handling estates, I'm already an expert witness in a case where an accountant failed to make a portability election, okay? So, and has been sued for malpractice as a result of that. And it was previously thought that there was no, what we call 9100 relief for that, meaning you can't get the IRS to allow you to make a late election. I've just been informed last week that um, the IRS is receptive to that, even though it's not really legally allowed, they are going to consider that. But I'm sure that's only a short-term thing because people weren't familiar with portability. So if, you're, if you are not filing portability, get somebody to sign off on it that says they know you're not so because you know hindsight is always 2020 and the kids later on may say why didn't you do that you know mom or dad i'm sure would have wanted you to do that sorry good advice um 
you know, probably the key issue with these tier one clients, uh, other than making the portability election, is going to be for them getting the, the, the step up in basis at, at, at both deaths. Because income taxes for them, you know, estate taxes, transfer taxes are really a non-issue. Income taxes are going to be the thing that's, that's going to be a certainty for them if assets are sold, which they're going to be at some point after the first or second spouse's death. Um, Again, you're going to want to use uh, trusts, even in these situations, if, you know, under the right circumstances, you know, for asset protection, management of the assets, to control, especially where you do not have a homogeneous family, to control where the assets go at the death of the second spouse. Um, you know, having these large exemptions, which we know now are permanent, and the husband and wife have combined, you know, over $10 million, it's going to sort of change our thinking or change the paradigm, I think, on, on a lot of, of things we've done for years, like insurance trust. Does a client even want to own, an, own insurance, depending on the, the, the face value in a life insurance trust? Or if they do, do they want to go through the hassle every year of doing crummy withdrawal letters in order to use the annual exclusion, or do they want to just use part of their basic exclusion amount? Because um, most clients don't send the crummy notices anywhere. Anyway, um, if that's for me, just hold the call. Um, you know, you still have to review uh, clients' retirement plan, uh, IRA, 401k, you know, uh, profit sharing plans, and make sure that those beneficiary designation do designations dovetail with the dispositive provisions in their documents. Um, next, you've got you know, probably a, a second tier of clients that is the combined net worth of the clients is more than one, per, one, one spouse's basis, basic exclusion amount, but it's less than the combined basic exclusion amount of the uh, two clients, less than $10.5 million. And there may be even different, different flavors of these clients. If you've got a young entrepreneur uh, and a spouse who's a doctor and they're at $8.5 million and they're 45 years old, you probably need to look at them growing their estate. If you've got a pair of 87-year-olds who are consuming their assets faster than they're growing, and, and they're in the, in the middle of this band, you probably don't need, much, need to worry too much about them moving up. Um, you know, this is where you know, the, the, the dilemma or the decision that Warren spoke of, you know, do you use the credit shelter? Do you use uh, the, the uh, DSU amount to carry, you know, port, port that over to the surviving spouse is the most critical is for, is for this, this middle group, this tier two group of clients. Um, and there are several ways to, uh, you know, m delay the decision, I guess, as to whether you're going to use the DSU amount or not. One way to, would be to leave everything outright to the surviving spouse and, and depend on him or her making a disclaimer question whether you can depend on that. It's one thing in the abstract to say, sure, if we can save taxes, I'll forego, you know, half of my, my spouse's estate so that it, you know, goes to somebody, uh, third parties or goes to, into a trust with other people's beneficiaries. But when the money's in hand, people don't, you know, they often have a different view of things, their perspective changes. So that requires some participation by the surviving spouse down the road. Uh, and, you know, other limitations on that if the surviving spouse disclaims that it goes into a traditional credit shelter trust, then he or she can still be a, a beneficiary and could even be a, a trustee, but any power to vary the distributions of the trust if the surviving spouse were the trustee would have to be limited by an ascertainable standard. Otherwise, the uh, disclaimer is not qualified. The other thing that Warren mentioned was to put everything into a Q-tippable trust. In other words, a, a trust that qualifies to, as a qualified terminable interest property trust. I think I used the same words twice, twice in that sentence. Uh, qualified, qualified, and property, property. But um, so anyway, it's under 2057, 2056B7 of the code. And you could have one trust, and you could Q-tip all of it, or you could Q-tip none of it, in which case you'd have to rely not on the marital deduction, which if you Q-tipped it, it would qualify, but rely instead on the first spouse's basic exclusion amount to protect that from estate tax at the first death. Or you could, you know, arrive somewhere in the middle and Q-tip a, a fraction of it. And um, if you did that, then you would probably, and, and it stayed in that one trust, you'd probably want to divide it for administrative ease into a Q-tip trust and a non-Q-tip trust. Now, the drawbacks of that is that it were the terms of a Q-tip trust require that all the income be distributed to the surviving spouse. So you've got, you know, you're leaking assets out of this trust that you otherwise wouldn't have to distribute. 
Um, and um, um, the other the other drawback is that only the surviving spouse can be a beneficiary of this Q-tip trust. So you know, an, a, a variation of that would be to follow you know the planning and it, what's called you know have a, a Clayton Q-tip, which is based on a, a case you might guess called Clayton. Uh, in which the taxpayer provided that assets went to the Q-tip trust, but if a Q-tip election wasn't made, the portion or fraction that wasn't elected went to another trust, a traditional bypass trust, which is, and, and so you could have the, delay the decision on whether to make the marital deduction uh, and preserve the DSU amount or to use all or a portion of the first spouse's basic exclusion amount until the first death make a partial Q-tip election. The assets that were Q-tipped would stay in the marital trust. The other assets would go into a bypass trust, which could have other parties, children as beneficiaries, or it could have not have the spouse as, as a beneficiary at all. Um, then you've got the top tier of clients, those above. Hang on just one second, 2001-38. Oh, sorry. We, That's we because wanted, I'm not worried about that. Yeah. But you have to worry <laughs> about it worry because about it's it. out there. there. There was a rev proc to, in 2001, 2138, uh, in which you know some, a taxpayer went to the IRS and said, well, when the first spouse died, a Q-tip election was made for this trust. But looking back at it, there weren't enough assets to necessitate that. The, the client had enough uh, estate, estate, the decedent had enough estate tax exclusion to cover the entire estate. So this was a, you know, a mistake to make a Q-tip election, and if you allow that, that means, you know, because the, the flip side, if you make a Q-tip election, it's included in the surviving spouse's death at his or at a state at his or her death. We don't want, that's, that's unfair to make us do that because the Q-tip election was not required. And the IRS, in, in sort of a remedial, you know, opinion said, okay, we're not, we're, we're going to say, and they, it was broader than it needed to be, the, the, the uh, uh, RevProc, it said if you make a Q-tip election and it was unnecessary, then to reduce a state tax, which it was in the case of the taxpayer who, who this was uh, directed to, then we're 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 not go we're going to pretend that the Q-tip election wasn't made. We're going to say that it was invalid. Well, now you got a situation where you may want to make a Q-tip election, even if there's no estate tax that would be paid in order to make a partial Q-tip election or to make a Clayton Q-tip election. And so there's a concern because this rep proc is still out there that the IRS would take the position that you couldn't do this, that it was an invalid Q-tip election from the beginning. Now they shouldn't because you know, it's a different situation. That was, the law was different. Uh, this was a remedial situation to help somebody, but I think, Warren, you correct me, the IRS has been present at some conferences where this has been brought up and people would say, of course, you'll probably recede from that, and they haven't said anything. Oh, no, we do not know that they're going to recede from that. Right. They are, it is under study, from right. what I understand, last week. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are lobbying them heavily, um, and hopefully they will um, uh, accede to that. Okay. Stay tuned. All right. Um, the, the factors that we've talked about in Tier 1 and Tier 2 continue to be, you know, uh, applicable to the Tier 3, the clients above $10 million five. Um, and, and traditional estate planning paradigm that's existed, I guess, since 1982, when you had the unlimited marital deduction come in, which was before I started practicing law, by the way, hard to believe. Um, he just has to rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> Only because I had another career before I went to law school. Um, uh, you know, still holds. You'll probably see a lot of people in that area still using, uh, you know, traditional marital trust credit shelter planning. Matt's going to talk about a lot of the gifting strategies that still apply for, uh, for clients in that, in that strata, that tier. Um, and I'm, I'm, I have some more things in my outline, but I'm, I'm being thoughtful of the time here because there are more, there's a lot more interesting stuff to cover. Um, one thing that, that's maybe used in the future that, that you, you haven't seen in the past would be to, you know, we talked about the benefit of uh, credit shelter trust is the appreciation on the assets avoids estate tax at the second spouse's death. You could even enhance that a little bit if you carried over the DSU to the surviving spouse, had him or her make a gift to a trust, 
an irrevocable trust and, and, and use the first spouse's DSU amount to cover that. And so all future appreciation is not going to be subject to estate tax, but to make that irrevocable trust a grantor trust as to the surviving spouse. So he or she is paying the income tax on that so that you've got, you know, compound non-taxable growth. But again, you have to depend on somebody to make that decision after they've got the money in, in his or her hand. Uh, and you know, if you get the assets in there and you've got the estate tax exclusion, but you decide later you want to get uh, uh, a step up in basis, you could always have the spouse purchase the assets back and there shouldn't be any, any income tax uh, uh, effect of that because it's a grantor trust, or if there's a substitution power to just substitute high basis assets, maybe even cash, for the low basis assets inside the grantor trust, get those out and have them in his or her estate when he or she dies, if you can predict the date that's going to occur. Um, and you're gonna be hearing a lot about that technique. That is probably the, the, the new thing, okay, that people are talking about and running numbers. And, it, and, and I've seen a lot of numbers that have been run um, and it can be a very powerful tool, uh, but it's not for everybody and you need to look at it carefully but it's something you're gonna be hearing a whole lot about. The last, the last thing I'm gonna say on, on this is you need, to, you need to address, if you're a planner, use of the DSU, the portability election, in your wills, your trusts, and probably if you're drafting pre, premarital agreements, in your marital agreements as to whether the election's going to be made, whether it's not going to be made, you know, wh who gets the DSU, how it's going to be used. And with that, I'm going to skip over the rest of my material and go to Brian, I think. All right, so I'm going to talk about income tax planning with respect to estates and trusts. And what I've done is essentially break it down into two areas. The first one is how do you avoid the higher rates in the 3.8% surtax? And then the second aspect is how do we make sure that we get to step up in basis at the death of each spouse? So many people in here are probably familiar that trusts have very compressed income tax brackets. You reach the 39.6% top rate at $11,950 of taxable income in 2013. This amount's indexed for inflation, but of course, it only grows at a very nominal amount each year. Um, but first and foremost, with respect to avoiding the higher rates and the 3.8% surtax, those two new taxes uh, only apply to tax years beginning on or after January 1st, 2013. So if you have a tax year that starts back in 2012, even though it carries over into 2013, you will not be subject to the higher income tax rates or the 3.8% surtax. With respect to irrevocable trust, you're on the calendar year. You really can't elect a fiscal year. But if you've had somebody that's died in 2012, an estate can make a fiscal year election and it can be less than 12 months. So if you had somebody died in uh, say April, you know, they could elect for their first fiscal year to end November 30th, 2012. Then you'd have a second tax year for the estate starting December 1st, 2012, carrying over to November 30th, 2013, and not be subject to these higher rates uh, for that time period. Now, also, if you've had a decedent who has a revocable trust, qualifies under Code Section 645, they can make an election for that revocable trust, which is now irrevocable, to be on the same uh, tax, fiscal tax year as the estate. So that's one way to get out of the higher rates. Just be aware that if you do decide to go uh, with that shorter, uh, with that fiscal year election, if you make distributions to the beneficiaries, the beneficiaries are gonna have to include those distributions to the extent their income um, in their gross income, which means it's gonna be subject to their tax rates, their tax year, which is 2013. So it could end up ultimately being taxed to the beneficiaries at the higher rates and the 3.8% tax. So what is a 3.8% Medicare tax apply to? And for estates and trusts, you pay the 3.8% tax on the lesser of the net investment income or the excess adjusted gross income over 11,950. Essentially, whatever your income is that's taxed at the top rate. Now, what that means is you can pay it on the, uh, the lesser, you can pay it on an amount that's gonna be less than your total net investment income, but it's never gonna be more than the total net investment income that you have. So you could have $100,000 in adjusted gross income in the trust, but if, you don't, if not, no portion of that is net investment income, then you're not gonna pay the 3.8% tax. 
So net investment income includes interest, dividends, rents, royalties, annuities, gains from distributions of property, or dispositions of property, excuse me, income from passive activities, which essentially means that most of the trust income is going to be net investment income. Um, what's not included in net investment income, distributions from IRAs, income from trade or business or tax exempt income. So one of the planning ideas is how can you take something that's net investment income and convert it into something that's not net investment income and therefore it wouldn't be subject to the 3.8% tax. One answer that you're going to see uh, brought up a lot is with respect to passive income. And this arises when you have trusts that own interest in limited partnerships, LLCs that are taxes partnerships, uh, S-Corps or something like that. Um, so to have something that's passive income, to be able to convert it to something that's non-passive income, what do you need to do? And to be treated as non-passive income, essentially there must be a trade or business and there must be material participation by the taxpayer. Now in the trust and estates arena, there's not hard and fast rules on what does it mean for a trust to materially participate in trader business. Um, the leading case that's been discussed a lot is this Carter v. U.S., which is a Northern District Court case from Texas, 2003. And in that situation, you had a testamentary trust that owned a uh, cattle ranch since 1956, so for several decades. Um, the trustee employed full-time ranch manager. He had full-time employees and part-time employees to assist in the ranching operations. Um, he also designated one of the beneficiaries to have oversight of some of the ongoing activities. The trustee was still involved in the activities, but what it came down to is that the IRS said, we want to look only at the activities of the trustee. We don't want to consider the activities of the individuals he's employed. Uh, you know, we don't want to consider the activities of the ranch manager or anything like that. Court said, wait a minute, IRS, you don't have any statutory, statutory authority to point to to only look at the trustee's activities. So ultimately, the court said, we're going to look at the activities of the trust as a whole, which includes the full-time employees, the ranch manager, and see whether there's material participation. And in that situation, they, you know, the court sided with the taxpayer. Now, that since then, the IRS has said, we don't agree with that decision, and it doesn't look like they're going to, they're still going to fight it, put it that way. Um, you know, so one question is, can you, if you have a trustee, sometimes it's family members, sometimes it's a corporation that doesn't materially participate in the activity. So can you appoint a special purpose trustee who's already involved in the business to uh, essentially attribute his activities to the trust? The IRS issued a 2007 technical advice memorandum that said, we're not going to consider the special purpose trustee activities unless he has essentially decision-making authority. I mean, if he's really just an agent of the trustee reporting back to the trustee who's still making all the decisions for the activity, then they're not going to find that to be participation on behalf of the trust. The next item is, you know, what do you do about capital gains? Capital gains are included in net investment income, and they can be subject, you know, at the top rate of 20%, add on additional 3.8% for the Medicare tax, you get a total of 23.8%. So the play here is, can you distribute out those capital gains to a beneficiary who's going to pay only 15% on those capital gains? Um, generally, under Section 643, capital gains are not included in income distributions. There is an exception, though, that says if you have authority under state law or the trust instrument that authorizes the trustee to distribute these capital gains as income, then you can flush out the capital gains. So then in that situation, they would be uh, taxed at the beneficiary rates instead of being taxed at the trust rates. This is certainly something you need to address planning up front in your trust documents. If it's not, if the power is not in there, uh, one thing you do is maybe do a non-judicial settlement agreement among the trustee and beneficiaries to add that power. You can even do a decanting if necessary. Or uh, there's also non-judicial modification statutes under Florida law that you can pursue. For those of you who have looked at a lot of our documents over the years and all of those millions of pages of powers clause, that we say are very important, but you know you don't necessarily have to read them and we don't go over them, that's included in one of those powers clauses. So we have provisions in our documents and have had for years for the ability to pass out capital gains. Just, have, just, just a little aside. 
one of those little paragraphs that <laughs> we've ignored. But it's important. With respect to grantor trust, the 3.8% tax basically applies at the grantor level. You still attribute all the income gains tax items to the grantor, and then you test at the grantor's level as to whether the 3.8% tax <coughs> is going to apply. Uh, so the question here is oftentimes you have wealthy grantors who make large gifts to grantor trusts. Even though distributions are made from those grantor trusts, that's not going to carry out the income to the beneficiaries. Everything's still going to be taxed to the grantor. So the play here is to consider whether it's now more beneficial to convert it to a non-grantor trust and have the non-grantor trust essentially pay its own tax. Um, if you convert it to a non-grantor trust, you have those compressed income tax brackets. You know, you reach the top rate at 11,950, but to the extent you make distributions to the beneficiaries, that flushes out the income and it'll be taxed to the beneficiaries at their rates. So if you have wealthy grantors, you have not so wealthy beneficiaries, then maybe this is something you do for income tax planning purposes uh, to get the income tax, the lower income tax rates for the beneficiaries. Um, just be careful uh, if you're converting to a, from grantor trust to a non-grantor trust, make sure that the powers you are releasing actually make it a non-grantor trust. You know, a lot of times people will see a power of substitution in a trust and they'll say, okay, we release a power of substitution Therefore, it's no longer a grantor trust. But sometimes what's overlooked is the broad provisions of 674, which essentially says if you, know, if you have a decanting distribution provision in there, it says you know, a trustee can make distributions for any purpose. And you have a trustee who's related to the grantor. <coughs> 674 is a hard one to get out of. So it might require you to make uh, changes in the trustees in order to uh, completely turn off that grantor trust status. So just one other, a couple other things, um, talking about planning for basis step up at the death. If you still have, you know, we have all these people that created uh, trust, have already gifted assets to trust, if those trusts have low basis, or those trust assets have low basis, uh, maybe you want to consider having the grantor repurchase those assets from the trust if there's no power substitution. If there is a power substitution, then the grantor can presumably um, substitute high basis assets, take out the low basis assets. Um, a lot of, sometimes grantors might not have the liquidity to uh, purchase those assets. So in that situation, you might want to have the grantor borrow from a third party, pay cash for the assets, and get the low basis assets back. Now, if, assuming that's a grantor trust, then you're not going to have a taxable event on that repurchase. Um, and then just to mention, planning for the basis step up, you know, at the death of the second spouse, um, David and Lauren touched on this. If you're using Q-tips, then you're going to get that basis step up at the second death. If you're using a credit shelter trust, when you're drafting, uh, consider adding in broad distribution provisions so that low basis assets can be distributed out to the surviving spouse prior, immediately prior to death um, so that they'll be included in her gross estate. Or one other issue, um, a little less uh, unorthodox, is Drafting in a provision that says an independent person can grant a general power of appointment in the surviving spouse. And therefore, if you have a general power of appointment, those assets are going to be taxed in the beneficiary spouse's gross estate and receive a basis step up as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Matt, who's going to talk about an income tax planning technique involving a charitable trust. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. I I'm supposed to talk about gifting strategies, but before I get there, I'm going to talk about a special technique that um, involves uh, saving income taxes for high income taxpayers that are uh, charitably motivated. And uh, for those of you who are playing along at home, I'm on page 26 of our outlines now. This is called a non qualified, non grantor charitable lead trust. Okay. And what this is designed to do is to get these high income taxpayers a 100% charitable deduction when they otherwise would be subject to code section 68. Uh, I think back in 2006, they started to phase out um, code section 68, which limits the amount that these high income taxpayers can get for their itemized deductions. And then it was gone from the books in 2010, 2011, and 2012. Now code section 68 is back. And for high income taxpayers, they can have as much as 
of their itemized deductions basically eliminated or cut back. So how does this technique work? Well, we set up this non-qualified, non-grantor charitable lead trust, and it provides that all income of the trust is going to go to a charity that is selected by the donor that creates the trust. Now, it is an all income to the charity, so it is non-qualified. Usually, they have to be an annuity or a unit trust uh, interest. And the donor does not receive a, an income tax deduction or a gift tax deduction when, it, when he creates this trust, and we design it so that the um, gift is basically incomplete. And it is going to come back into the donor's estate later. So this is not an estate or gift tax uh, planning transaction. It's designed to get the income tax deduction. Well, the donor takes an asset, and preferably one that has a steady stream of income, and the donor makes a contribution to this uh, trust. And the income that the donor would otherwise receive and report on his personal income tax return is now being reported to the trust. And the trust then takes that income and contributes it to the charities that are selected. And under Code Section 642C of the code, there's a 100% charitable deduction for that income that goes to those charities. So donor's income goes down, no longer receives the income from the assets that contributed to the trust. Trust gets the income, gets a 100% deduction for it because trusts are not subject to Code Section 68. So in this way, donors who would otherwise be cut back by Code Section 68 can set up this trust, move the income over there, and get a 100% charitable deduction for the amount that they can want to contribute to charities on an annual basis. And this works particularly well if they have assets that are producing a steady, consistent stream of income year over year. Okay. Uh, now moving on to uh, the... It's not so much a deduction as it is that you don't really report the income. Correct. That's what happens is the donor doesn't have that income, so he doesn't pay income tax on it, and the income that goes into the trust gets a 100% deduction, so there's no tax over there. You're correct. It's not so much a deduction as an exclusion for, of, of income that they otherwise would have. Mm -hmm. So, okay, moving on to um, gifting strategies. Now I'm on page 27, and I know we have limited time here, so uh, I'm going to keep my remarks um, pretty succinct, and I, I just want to try to make two points uh, in this section because obviously it's a very incredibly broad section talking about you know gifting strategies in 2013 and beyond and, and those two points are if, if we have moderately wealthy clients that and by moderately wealthy I mean that may not be subject to a state tax um, at the time they're coming in for advice but are still looking to make gifts taxes are still an important consideration in making those gifts and two, for those uh, high net worth clients that are subject to state uh, taxes currently and will likely be subject to state taxes going forward, there's never been a better time for them to make gifts uh, than right now. So just turning back to the um, moderately wealthy people, uh, oftentimes they're going to make gifts that aren't necessarily tax motivated. And so that group of, of clients has, has grown as the exemption has, has gotten greater. Um, taxes may not be motivi motivating them to make these gifts, but there may be other reasons for them to make gifts. I think a typical situation is, is when they have a, a family business and you have a child that works in that family business and the patriarch or matriarch wants to get to that child interests in the family business. Um, but they're no longer uh, uh, necessarily subject to the uh, estate tax anymore because they're, they're less than, you know, if they're joint, less than 10 and single, less than $5 million per person. So do we need to be concerned about um, the use of exemption for these clients? And I think in, in the situation, and as David mentioned and earlier, we might have two different kinds of situations. One where you have the patriarch, their estate's not growing, and one maybe where they're a little bit younger and the estate is growing. So if you have the uh, potential to pay taxes sometime in the future, then clearly preserving the estate tax uh, exemptions are going to be an important part of the planning considerations. And even if uh, we think that the estate will never exceed the current estate tax exemption, I would still propose that preserving the estate tax exemptions to the extent possible is advisable. And, and the reason is, 
and, and as Lauren mentioned and earlier, that even though we've never had the exemption go backwards from where we've been, it's always gone up, and it would be a highly unusual situation for that to happen. I think we are in a highly unusual time right now. We are running deficits year over year that we've never run before. Our debt is astronomical. We have unfunded liabilities that are in the multi-trillions of dollars. In short, our government is going to need revenue. So I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that sometime in the future we may have less exemption than what we're dealing with right now. So I think it's important for people who are structuring these transactions to take taxes into consideration and structure them in a way where they go out and purchase appropriate and proper appraisals to report the gifts to the government so that they can preserve their exemption because they may need it later. Um, in addition, when dealing with uh, these gifts, there's a couple of things that, that we, we really now sort of have a shift in emphasis on our focus instead of just the state and gift taxes, we also have to keep our eye on the income tax consequences of those gifts. And one is, you know, what are the uh, income tax consequences when we have a carryover basis from the donor to the donee? Um, if your client uh, would otherwise not pay estate taxes and the property was included in their estate, they would get a step up in basis to the fair market value of those assets at death and could leave those assets to the donee when they died, um, thereby saving the donee in income taxes. If they make the gift during life, it may be difficult to draw that property back into the estate. Perhaps they do it in trust and have a power of substitution or a general power of appointment than Brian uh, talked about earlier. But you're going to want to consider what the effects are of income taxes on the donee when making these gifts. Um, in addition, you should consider uh, the possibility of shifting income. As income tax rates go up, and perhaps your patriarch or matriarch is in a higher bracket than your donee and maybe moving that income generating, generating asset down to the next level is going to save income taxes year over year. Um, and so maybe that's more important consideration than the loss of your step up in basis is over time. So these are just new focus that we have when we're planning for these um, uh, clients. With respect to our very wealthy uh, clients, and that's those people who are subject to estate taxes, I th think right now is an ideal time for them to be making uh, uh, gifts. They have more exemption available than they've ever had before, which allows us to leverage wealth transfers. And we haven't lost any of the uh, planning techniques that have provided us such good leverage in years past. But as Lauren mentioned earlier, and this is back on pages three and four of your outline, um, there are a number of items that have been mentioned in the Green Book, which I think almost every one of them, Lauren said, is likely to pass, if not this year in the near future, that would make uh, leveraging gifts for wealthy clients um, much more difficult to do. And, and the big ones are, are um, discounting of assets. Um, whether grant or trusts would be subject to a state uh, inclusion. Um, if we can only do grants with minimum terms um, and, and minimum uh, uh, amounts of remainder. So those kind of, of deals, if they're taken off the table, would impact what we can do uh, for clients today. And so um, the basic you know, thought process that we have is that the, the gifting is, is, that for these people is pretty much the same. And on page 27, you can see where our advantages are. These are the same advantages that we've always uh, uh, had with respect to gifts. When we make gifts, we remove the appreciation and income of the gifted assets from the estate. Um, we can use discounting to further leverage those gifts. If we put these gifts in a grantor trust, which is treated one and the same as a grantor for income tax purposes, so that the grantor is responsible for paying the taxes on that gift, that gift gets to grow income tax free. So that further leverages the gift. Um, and we can also allocate generation skipping, which has been increased as well to these gifts, and we can have multi-generational compounding. So um, those are all the same uh, kind of advantages that we've always had. And for those clients that 
Um, never wanted to pay gift tax, which has been a huge concern of ours over the last years. We've done formula clauses and formula gifts to avoid the gift tax. Well, perhaps now that the exemption is increased, they have a cushion, you know, so they can make these gifts without fear of having paying gift tax. Um, just uh, I have a f only a couple of minutes left, so let me just kind of skip ahead and, and just make a couple of, of quick points. Um, one, the cost of living adjustment um, is going to be taken advantage by a lot of our wealthy clients, I think, going forward. Um, everybody knows that the annual exclusion has increased every uh, f three or four years or so when by rounding, and it's up to $14,000 per year. Well, now the exclusion amount is also increasing for cost of living adjustment, and it's likely to increase every year. So our clients who have used up their exemptions in prior years are going to get more exclusion. Uh, going forward and so they're probably going to be getting on an annual program of utilizing that additional exclusion year over year just like they would with exemptions and um, this is a, a also a, just a, a small point perhaps but um, Lauren talked about the DSU and that's the uh, amount of exemption that you can get from uh, a deceased spouse and just one point there is if if the surviving spouse doesn't use that DSU and then remarries, they could lose the ability to use the DSU. Um, so the surviving spouse who gets a DSU from a spouse can use that spouse's DSU first before using their own exemption, and then they can actually remarry and survive spouse number two and get some more DSU and then make another gift and then remarry and then survive spouse three and then make another gift and then remarry and so forth and get all this DSU. And, and Brian and I were looking at the <laughs> estate tax return and, and, and joking about it, perhaps because we, we have no lives or no sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> but the 706 form for this, uh, where you have to report how many DSU amounts from prior spouses that you've used in the past is literally about 12 lines long. <laughs> so you have plenty of room to remarry, gift, remarry, gift, remarry, gift. But it's okay. the last deceased spouse that you have if you die. That's right. Okay. So you can, you can get it by gift and use it, prior ones, but it's the very last one that, is that, that you survive. Okay. It's the last deceased spouse that you get to use for a state tax exemption, right. not gift tax exemption. That's right, yeah. that's right. So it's, the idea is marry, kill, gift. Marry, kill, gift. Marry, kill, gift. That's right. We're not advising clients to do yeah. this, <laughs> but it is there. Um, and then, of course, we do have an increased amount of generation skipping exemption, so I, I think we ought to be looking uh, at how we can use that uh, generation skipping exemption. There are existing trusts out there that are not skipping trusts that can be modified or decanted so that they become skipping. And that is a very, very powerful tool to move wealth through generations without being subject to estate tax. So that's what we're looking at using some of that existing generation skipping exe uh, exemption that our clients have. Um, I, I think we're really out of time. I had a few examples, but I know that Lauren wants to at least mention a, a, a there, couple we, of recent developments. So I'm going to skip over the examples and turn it back. But we're over here to, to answer Lauren. any questions afterwards. We just wanted to mention a couple of current developments. It has nothing to do with planning for 2013 and, and taxes, but might be important to you. Um, one, I included in here in your materials my outline from Heckerling this year. Um, uh, part of which was about Florida's new Uniform Principal and Income Act changes there that are really very important that went into effect on January 1st of this year. So if you're not familiar with what those changes are, you might want to take a look because they're pretty important. And the second thing is that there was a case that came out last fall called uh, Mori versus Everbank. And for anybody who deals with beneficiary designation forms for life insurance, this is a very, very important uh, case to know about. 
Uh, it is a scary case. It's a provision. Uh, it had a, it, this was a, a gentleman who had a revocable trust uh, that was the beneficiary of a substantial amount of life insurance. He died with an insolvent estate owing uh, lots and lots and lots of dollars. And so the creditors came after the life insurance payable to his revocable trust and were able to get it. The court said that the exemption that would otherwise apply to life insurance, uh, death benefits, was waived because of provisions in his revocable trust that said pay to the personal representative whatever debts uh, you know that I have uh, like your most trusts do. And like there's a statute that provides for that. Uh, but because there was some special language in um, this trust and because the First District Court of Appeals doesn't know at all what it's doing, it uh, held that they waived the life insurance exemption from creditors by having it payable directly to the revocable trust without having any specific language in it to preserve the exemption. So this is a huge trap for the unwary. If you're going to have benefits, uh, life insurance benefits payable to a revocable trust, make sure that revocable trust has provisions in it that specifically provide for the life insurance exemption to continue for those benefits or don't make it payable to the revocable trust. Instead, have those benefits payable to the subtrusts that are created under the revocable trust like we do when we have an estate. Okay. So, uh, by the way, we are working on fixing that. Uh, there, I'm on a committee that's uh, drafting new legislation. Um, it will not go in this year. Uh, so uh, the earliest that we can see a fix for this is uh, next year, 2014. So in the meantime, be careful because I think it's a real concern. Uh, lastly, uh, after about a uh, birthing period of seven years, uh, there is finally uh, the, the LLC task force has submitted its proposal to the legislature, which is expected to pass, and there will be hopefully uh, enacted an entire new LLC statute. Our LLC statute is old and had not been updated uh, as much as it should have been, and we've been working on doing that for a long time. So, uh, you know, if that passes, you'll get a, it'll be on our blog, there'll be an email out about it. We may even have a program because it is a complete rewrite of the LLC statute and has some pretty important changes. So stay tuned for that. And with that, we are here if you have any. Oh, also, please, Karen reminds me, uh, fill out your um, yellow sheets if you would. We really do read those uh, very carefully. And any suggestions are greatly appreciated uh, for topics or anything else that we can do to improve things. Um, and also look for our email out shortly telling you what the topics and the dates for our next couple of presentations are. And, and so we'll all be available for questions for a while. And we'll all be available for questions. I know you all want to get back to work, but if anybody wants to ask us questions, um, please feel free to do so. Thank you Thank all you for all. coming. Thank you.